might seem really minor and like we're just having like information but they're the really valuable things that we need to know in terms of like it's great you like the idea of it but it's just not accessible and that for us is something where we can go okay how can we make this as accessible as possible and we when you're trying something we're just assuming people might like this sort of thing and as you more events you worked out oh actually there's a demand for this or people want this and they really like this that's exactly what we're doing at the moment in terms of we've had ideas that i genuinely thought we're going to make this like the best company in the world and be like everyone's going to love this like we're going to get a million people and then like two people were like oh yeah it's right and i was like oh, i've got the audience so wrong in my head but likewise it's things where i thought by your room was started a few months ago now it's been a while and we started it at the beginning of the pandemic uh, because we wanted to share some science and we were doing some very short um talks for uh, biologists and and then for the second edition we decided to move forward to the next step so we also introduced another session on career development so we did different sessions on that and then now we are in a session of science communication or communication in general this this edition of like this session of today is very broad and it's about networking so we have our invited guest um, Callum, it's very nice to see you here, and he's a Durham University graduate and current uh, MBA student at American International College at the USA in America, and he's the co-founder of Scientist, so that's probably how you, most of you, um, you know him, and that's how I met him. So um, I hope that he will also give an introduction of scientists and will let us know more about this amazing platform so that everybody can join. And I think most of us already joined that, uh, but it's always uh, nice to hear more about that. So um, Callum will speak to us today about the power of networking. And I'm very happy, as usual, if you have questions, either type in the chat or just feel free to interrupt um, the, his mm, talk and his presentation. And we always uh, say that this is a safe space, even if we are recording it, you can let us know. Uh, I don't want that part where I say I said that thing uh, in the recording on YouTube. So you can just let us know and we will cut it out. Actually, Leah will do that because he is taking care of the post editing of the videos. So he's not here today. He is my co-organizer and uh, actually all the most of the people here are co-organizers uh, for these editions because all of them they acted as co-chairs for each session this edition so that was great thank you everyone and um, Callum I'll leave you the stage that's great thank you very much obviously is if my connection goes at any point if my face just completely disappears just talk amongst yourselves carry on and just pretend that you enjoyed what I had to say because my wife Wi-Fi is being terrible today, so who knows what could happen. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, Carmen, for obviously inviting me to come. I see a lot of familiar faces that I've met previously at um, scientist virtual events or just sort of seen generally around, um, which is really good. And I think sort of it's kind of a great session to have networking because I think a lot of the people that will we'll be attending today are active networkers themselves. You are sort of the thought leaders that go out there and happy to get involved with events, help facilitate things. And um, sort of, it's great to be able to get the message out to you guys because then you go and sort of spread it to everybody else, um, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, as Carmen mentioned, I graduated from Durham this year. Um, and then technically I'm studying in America at university, uh, but because of COVID, I'm based in the, in the UK still, like most people. So I still get to look outside at the terrible weather every day and things like that, which is not amazing, but um, you know, at least I'm healthy and things like that, which is great. Um, so a bit of background about scientists. Yeah, so this is all about the future of networking, the power of networking, whatever you want to call it, unnecessary title. So a little bit of what I want to talk to what I want to talk about is a little introduction to scientists and sort of a lot of people will be questioning sort of like, what's the point of scientists? Why is it sort of a thing? Like we already have Twitter, this is how we all know each other, academic Twitter, like this is fulfilling my functions really well, or I use LinkedIn and all of these different reasons. Um, so I'll sort of try and explain my version of how I think networking is changing and the trends within academia and how we do things in academia. Um, then a bit about why networking is important and try and be really specific in nailing down sort of the career development aspect, the academic development aspect, and then sort of the personal well-being or the personal development kind of thing. Uh, and then a few top tips from me of sort of things that I think everybody should be doing more. Um, and I try to make these 
not sort of the generic things that if you Google like how share network, they'll come up. I've tried to be a bit specific, but yeah, I'd love your feedback at any point to just stop me, ask a question or say something from your personal experience or anything like that, because I think everyone's got different experiences, which is really important. Um, cool. So Scientist essentially um, is a network platform. So we call ourselves like the LinkedIn for the research community. So the way that I see it is that you have platforms like ResearchGate that came up and grew at the times of Facebook and things like that, which have become really established. They've got millions of members, but they're very much to do with disrupting the publication industry. So it's like, how can we publish open access papers? How can we connect people through citations and things like that? So the problems that I've sort of identified are, first of all, if you're a PhD or an early career researcher and you don't have a lot of publications under your belt already, it's very difficult to gain traction on a platform such as ResearchGate because how's anybody going to find out who you are? The purpose why you use it is not to necessarily form connections. It's not to get a gauge of who else works in your field and things like that. Um, so nothing against research, great, uh, great, great platform, but it doesn't solve a networking function. And likewise, with something like LinkedIn, unless you have a lot of industry experience and you have a lot of um, work under your belt where you've worked here or you did a placement here and things like that, especially in the UK, that's a massive thing. You don't really have your academic CV and your LinkedIn profile doesn't really serve as a function that a recruiter would want to see. Um, and people won't really form connections with you because you don't have that industry experience. So there's sort of this void in networking in academia of, okay, there's clearly a need for something because all of us academics and researchers and students have taken to Twitter a, a social platform that wasn't created for us at all. It doesn't really serve any purpose, but it's a great way for everybody to connect, to join these sort of mini communities, to have big accounts like Academic Chatter that can amplify your voice and things. So there's definitely a need for it, but are we potentially missing out on a trick of having our own dedicated academic space where it's the sole purpose of networking um that's what we sort of think we are so this is sort of how i map out um networking in terms of how it's dressing and that's why the presentation um is called the future of networking or the power of networking so traditionally obviously we have physical networking events so really good still probably the most effective way to network you meet people at conferences you get to the exchange business cards exchange a linkedin handle whatever it is um great hopefully they come back very soon obviously touchy subject at the moment but we can always hope for the best um email which i don't know about people that are not from the uk but at our universities and institutions everything you find out about from your institution is through email so they're starting to get a bit better on social media but if you want that about an event a career opportunity a workshop it will come to your email inbox and if your inbox is anything like mine you have loads of different things that come in from different channels and things that you don't even want to be emailed and all that and things just go everywhere and go missing and traditionally we have our academic cv that's laid out in a very standard format way that we know people this is where i did my undergrad my master's my phd whatever whatever stage you're at and these are the things i researched these are the transferable skills that i've learned and it's all well and good having that cv but often people are looking for okay how have you already applied that to industry and that's what makes you sort of more excitement um to recruiters so the next sort of phase that we've moved into is the digital world so that's sort of the phase i'm sort of seeing us in now and obviously you can see from the logos in the future that we're sort of moving into that way is that we have twitter and facebook and traditional social media that is fantastic it's so much better than what anyone's ever created before and it has fantastic user interface and things that are like so easy to use and everyone probably found out, found out about this event from Twitter. So it's obviously fantastic and it's serving a great function. And likewise with ResearchGate, that's something that people have gone, okay, how can we apply social media to academics? And I've discussed the issues that I think we have with those. And moving into the future, we obviously have Zoom. We're using it right now. It's sort of virtual networking, essentially, of how can we get people together in this format? We can gain so many more experiences and perspectives from people that are around the world, from people that would be restricted from going to a physical and things like that. And then we have scientists, which obviously I've put as the future because right now we don't have millions of members, hundreds of thousands of members. We have about 1,500 members from about 75 universities around the world. So a very small sample size of people, but using that sort of small group that we've got and listening to the feedback of people and why did you sign up when you saw the link why did oops <laughs> why did you want to come then um we can sort of learn okay what are the problems elsewhere and how can we provide that solution and the reason why i've said i see a future of networking is because the platform that you log on and see now is not how i think it would be in six months how i think it would be in a year how i think the final product of scientists will ever be 
ultimately the reason that why we've created it is to try and find a solution for people and we're still generating okay what are the actual problems how can we genuinely give you some value for it and make you want to come onto it every day and go actually i'm gaining something from this so yeah that's a bit of background of networking and why we even need to bother sort of talking about it so importantly it's not a sales pitch at all like when carmen contacted me about the event it's not just to try and say everybody sign up for scientists like yeah this is a great opportunity for me everyone's given their time and try and learn something and that's something that i like completely understand and the point of this is not to make you all go scientists is great in fact some of the most valuable things that i've learned and that have progressed our platform forward have been in our own virtual networking events when people have said well, actually, like, why don't you have this? Or the reason why I don't use scientists is because this does this really well and things like that. And that's where we've been able to learn and go, actually, these are things that we really need to change. So even recently, we sort of completely changed the layout of the menu bar and things because people said, you've got loads of stuff, but I can't find what I want because the way you've laid it out to us go discover or follow or anything like that. Um, so these are all things that we're learning. So I'm not trying to, to win you over. I'm trying to sort of put across my point of how I think we can find people, so valuable people connection sort of get gain something tangible from these conversations find opportunities so is it an academic is a uh, a career opportunity and sort of like a job um, and find support as well so how can you find people that are going through a similar time to you or have been through similar things to you and learn from their experience and make your time a little bit easier so with things like thesis writing if somebody's already been through writing and done all that themselves better to speak to but unless you have them involved in your network you're never going to be able to find out. The main thing that I want to sort of for you to take away and really have in your mind, and I think I'm probably preaching to the converted here because by the nature of attending, you're all proactive people that want to learn new things. You want to uh, meet new people and gain these connections. But ultimately, anything that I say is completely irrelevant unless you're proactive. So what that means is how can you put yourself out there, even if it's outside your comfort zone and go, I'm going to be able to look for this. So I'm going to build the door that finds me the next opportunity rather than waiting for someone to come through my door and hand me something on a plate. So the idea is with networking that the more that you give and the more that you feed into your own network, that uh, that network will be able to give back to you essentially. So it's not all about just waiting for something to happen and what can other people do for you, but what can you give out to people and hope to gain something back. So the first thing to talk about really is um, about career development. So is what people see online who you actually are. And I don't mean this from the point of view of, oh, be careful what you put out there because you never know what people could see kind of thing because everybody's adults and that's sort of a basic thing. But it's more the people that you're choosing to engage with, the content that you're choosing to produce or to have connected to your profile online. Is that an accurate representation of the kind of person you would be for a job or a kind of person that you would be for somebody that wants to connect with you? Because ultimately, these pieces, as I've tried to display in a very blurred image, are, are all little bits of you that people will look at. And if they can resonate with one thing that they think, ah, this person does this, then they can bring you into your network. And you never know when that bit's going to amplify and you're going to be able to gain something from that. So a little bit of a, a study in terms of employment selection methods. The long and short of it is that through the nature of finding out more about social media from us reckoning we like and what we don't like as individuals and what profiles we do and don't associate with. So when you someone follows you on Twitter and you look at your notifications, immediately pretty much you can work out if you think that is a spam, if you think it's a bot, if you think it's a follower that you don't want to follow you and you need to block them. And that's such a split second decision because certain characteristics we associate with those things. And that's a very material example because you might see they don't have a bio or it, there's this and this problem and you can easily work it out. But it's very much the same in terms of how people rate your social profile and how they associate things that you put online and your attitude and tone online to what kind of person you would be in person as an individual. So an example of when we're networking is you should only expect similar people to you to a part of you, I may add, they don't have to be the same as you, to want to connect with you. So thinking about those jigsaw pieces and all the bits of you that you're trying to show people online, of, I'm, I'm really into this, I'm really into this, this is one of my passions, this is something that I've got experience in. The tone of how we put those across ultimately will form a rating in somebody's mind of how valuable they think you are to their network. And the same goes for employment selection. So very much the impression that you can give to say, or oh, I outwardly give these content because I contribute towards this blog, or I openly have got a track record of replying to people to make sure they're okay when they put tweets that are a bit emotional or things like that. 
they're all the things that build into the sort of profile rating that an employer would give you to say, actually, that's a person that would really suit my workplace or a person that really wouldn't. The point being, we've grown accustomed now to having to rate people based on the social profiles because the amount of people we meet compared to who we meet online is sort of so dramatic. Sort of some examples here of how employment is moving online. So in terms of career development and networking, these are some examples from Twitter and then from scientists from the job board as well. A little bit how I said in traditional networking methods, how everything would come to your inbox and things like that. Nowadays, things are actually all moving online. So if you were to reply to one of these tweets, as you can see on the left-hand side, or if you were to go and apply for one of the jobs on, on the job board, the first barrier and the first thing they would see through your interaction is that social profile that you have. So all of those jigsaw pieces matter more than ever in finding careers. So the second is about your academic development. So this is, are you connecting with the right people? And by the right people, I don't necessarily mean sort of people that are good or bad or are, are people funny and you want to laugh online or whatever it is, but in terms of who is the right fit for the thing that you need. So when you're networking with a purpose and it's not just using social media, I thinking, actually, if I was to collaborate with someone in my academic field, then I need to be connecting outwardly with those people that are in my field. Or if it is that actually I'm looking for a career, then you need to be actively finding people that are in charge of a lab group that might be able to give you an opportunity or connecting with universities online and different things like that. So this is all about how we're networking with the purpose of joining up the right links with different people. So on Twitter, when you scroll down, this is taken from the top, I'm sure on the phone, it says very similar, but ultimately you'll get given suggestions for who you want to follow. Now, Ultimately, this is an algorithm, as everybody knows. So who you've been interacting with and the types of people, you'll then be spat out, oh, you might want to follow these people or everyone in your community is following these people, so you should do the same. It's obviously an algorithm, not an opinion. So you have a choice every time you scroll down. Should I follow this person? Yes or no? And you yourself can see, oh, this is why I've been suggested it because recently I liked this tweet or because I've followed somebody else who's at their same university and things like that. It's all about how can we break down that rec recognizing that it's an algorithm and work out actually is that a good choice for me and often if you're not networking in the right places then you'll have no suggestions for you because the algorithm is only going to spit out things that you have previously engaged with so by constantly following people that are suggested for you you're broadening your network but you're only really broadening your network very minimally within the same sort of sphere it's constantly adding people that you might know people that, that know you already and things like that Instead, can we network with a purpose and go, okay, this is what I want to actually get out of it. If I could have a dream opportunity where I met somebody and this is what it resulted in, let me go out and try and find those sort of people. So that's all about how can we search for specifics. So as you can see there, it says objectives. What are you looking for when you're connecting with people? Is it that you just want to be really informed of everything that's going on in academic Twitter? You want to know all the gossip, all the things that are going on, which case you go around and you follow every single popular account because they read things and brilliant. You've got your network and you think, fantastic, it served my purpose. If your objective is like, I don't know if, if I can't see your face to hear it, but if you're still in the call, I know we've previously had conversations about looking for employment and things like that. If your objective is, okay, how can I find a job in the UK, for example, then the people that you need to be connecting with will be very different to, oh, I like to go on academic Twitter just to have fun and like chill out, if that makes any sense at all. So it's all about how can we go out there and really network with an objective and then the final thing is more of a something to be wary of. And I think it's one of the biggest issues on academic Twitter at the moment of you have sort of three groups of people, one group of people that think academic Twitter is the most positive thing in the world. It's the best and I love it. And you have one group that think, whoa, academic Twitter is so negative. Like all I see is people complaining. I never want to be on it. And then you have this middle group of people that go, oh, I recognize the good and the bad. I see the purpose. And the difference between those groups ultimately is that Apart from the middle group, everybody else is stuck in a little bit of an echo chamber. So they're seeing the same type of people. They're connected with the same type of voice, the same people in the same countries, the same universities or the same point in their career. All of those negative comments or all of those positive comments are consistently amplified and you only hear from one opinion. So if you want to put out a tweet and gauge genuine opinions or a broad range of feedback, you're only going to get that if you yourself have built a network around you of diverse opinions. Um, and cultures, religions, whatever it is that you're specifically looking for. So something to be wary of when you're building your network is how am I getting a diverse range of input here?
and am I just consuming the exact same information that's being retweeted and spam same people all the time? Um, so an example here of academic development, these were both taken from the, the function actually doesn't look like this right now, but the group section on scientists. So obviously one way to be able to find people is literally joining interest-based groups. So this is what I'm specifically looking for to collaborate in academics. So let me join someone in my field. Likewise, you can see from Paul here, like just putting yourself out there and saying, is anyone interested in this sort of thing? You don't need to know what you want it for. You don't need to be able to say, I've got an opportunity or let's work on this, but just finding those people and going, oh, it's great to connect. And let's just bear in mind that now we've got that connection. So if something comes up, we can work on it together or whatever. So don't be afraid to go, okay, how can I broaden my network with a diverse group of people? So finally, and this one is probably the most poignant at the moment with everything that's going on is sort of who can you share your experiences with? So I don't know if anybody else ever experiences this sort of thing, but if you try and speak to your parents or your family members about what you do, they probably don't really understand it exactly unless they've been through that circumstance. Like you're either at school or you're an adult in a lot of parents' minds. Like they don't really understand what, what the situation is of what's going on. Having people that can relate to you and understand your specific issues or specific challenges that you might be facing is something that I think is really important and probably the number one thing to build into your network. So when you're going through those difficult times or you need some advice on a very specific thing, which in academia happens all the time because it's so unique compared to the, the workplace, if you don't have those people in your network, you're simply not going to be able to gain the advice and support that you need. So a study from Nature, which gets published literally everywhere, and the statistics are like you guys know already, the statistics are just everywhere about health, about the issues that academia is causing and sort of like it or not, whether it comes from an institutional level of we need university to do more, whether it comes from an attitude of, of researchers towards work ethic and how many publications you should be getting, like wherever you want to place the blame is like a personal choice and it's not necessarily relevant to this. But the point is that whether you're going through it or somebody else is going through it, it is ultimately an issue. So finding people in your network that you have to support you through that, whether it be I need a one-to-one -one conversation with with somebody or just have a general oh actually i've been getting really caught on thing but look here's 100 people in my network that are tweeting about the fact that they've already been through it themselves or let me be able to go on to scientists and, um write a quick message to the group of career advisors who can reply to me and say oh don't worry like you should expect to get turned down in your first 10 job interviews like on average it's 12 and then it makes you go oh perfect okay that's absolutely fine those are little things that with having that network around you you simply wouldn't know so this is an infographic that you might have seen going around from zoe we've actually got on thursday we're releasing a podcast uh, episode of zoe so that'll be something definitely to listen to an example here on the screen as you can see of all, all the sort of different things that an institution can do in order to support you and the one com big conversation that I've sort of had with Zoe before is it's, it's brilliant sort of telling all of us PhD students, all of us academics, like this is what institutions ultimately, unless enough people tell the institutions, please, can you do this? Or this is something that we actively need, um, then it doesn't really get anywhere. And this is something that as scientists we're really trying to do is how can we as like a business and as an organization, how can we work with institutions to not pressure them to almost make change almost give them a bit of leverage to make change to so say look we've got all of these members that when polled and when surveyed have said these are the common issues these are the things that they want if you can't directly provide them how can we work with you as a third party to make sure that we're delivering these to people so something that we're soon to launch as scientists is to have uh, we're trialing it at the moment is to have a, a monthly service where people can get access to mental health support, wellness support, and things like that. So if you do, if you're in your time of need, or if it is something that you just need somebody to constantly remind you about the realities of your situation, then you have that service to go to. And the last thing that we really want, really in the long term, is for students to have to pay to cover that cost because I personally don't believe it's something that students should have to do I think it's something that institutions have the ability to do but if they're not willing to put the resources in to do it themselves we're trying to lend that hand to say okay if you can't provide the staffing if you don't know um, yourself what to physically do we're offering you a service that x amount of researchers have said this is something that I definitely want so can you contribute towards the operating costs of that and that's something that we're 
in a in a big dilemma about exactly how to go through it and anyone that's dealt with universities before will know that in the UK at least the organizations are so bureaucratic that you just get passed around and it's so difficult to nail down the person who can put his, his or hers hand in their wallet and say this is how much money I can give you towards something so yeah we're working on it hope so you know okay so some top tips these are things that might seem obvious if you're a very active networker and something you really enjoy doing but I think it's something to always have in your mind of your network is not just a list of people you know it's a list of people that you would like to know as well so being active so who would you like to meet make start with your wildest dreams like oh brilliant I'd love to meet whoever it is use the same bolt give him a follow like brilliant but that's fine but ultimately you have to be thinking what would you gain from that so if I meet Usain Bolt and make a connection with him, I'll probably just message him and say, oh, great, like, you're really fast. I'm not going to actually gain from that. So is he a valuable person to have in my network? Potentially not. So when we're being proactive, can we think about what do we want to gain? What can we give outwardly to other people? And who are those people that would gain from us? So if you're someone who has completed a PhD and you're further up in academia or you've made a transition to industry, you would be extremely valuable to be able to pass on your knowledge or your personal experience or any tips you have to somebody that might be wanting to make that jump now you would have to put yourself out there and outwardly give something to somebody else but in the long term you would be gaining something back yourself so that sort of links to the second point which is not to force it and just be yourself in the situation networking can be a difficult task and in academia it's a very sort of like scary word for a lot of people like networking people just think it means going over to the food stand at the conference and sort of trying to make small talk with somebody about the reason why you're there or something. But ultimately, networking becomes even harder if you're portraying a version of you that isn't yourself and you think you have to be a certain way. If people use LinkedIn, you'll see this from a lot of people, first posts who sort of feel they have to be really formal on LinkedIn and like use everything correct punctuation and only speak about things without emotion and sound very boring and bland when this is not the case at all because you can just completely be yourself. And if somebody rejects that or if you're not the right fit then that's not somebody that you necessarily need in your network and you'll find so much easier if you feel you can interact online and in person and it is coming naturally from you rather than feeling that you have to fit a certain mold the third one is to act upon introductions so this is something that i think is really important in terms of we're often very good at finding that first link with somebody so we follow someone or they follow back or send them a connection request and we say oh it'd be great to connect because i see you also work in chemistry Me too, like, let's join, let's connect. But how can we then act upon those introductions? The follow-up phase is really important. So if you see that that person that you connected with two weeks ago has recently had a publication or they've got a blog or whatever it is, can you follow them with some sort of introduction? So to say, oh yeah, that's, that's really great. Or I found this really interesting. I read this, or I've been following you a while now and I've just seen this. And how can we sort of reinforce those introductions? Because if you don't do it, nobody probably will. And everybody will be sat there in this situation going, oh, I wish that person looks really cool. Like, I wish they'd really reach out. Like, we could really work on this. Or that blog post was really good. I wrote a very similar one a year ago. I wish that we could talk about it. And if everyone's thinking that in this situation, we as individuals, as networkers, we have to just step up and go, okay, I'm going to be the person that makes everybody else feel comfortable by putting myself out there. The fourth one about being relevant and up to date. This is both in a specific sense and in a broad sense. Broadly being up to date is obvious. It's very much like what's going on in the world. Like when you're making connections, it's all about being informed about things that's going on. But I prefer to look at this in a far more specific way. So in your personal network with what you want to gain, how can you be a thought leader and an expert or seem like an expert of sorts in that particular area? And by expert, I don't mean you know the answers, you know the right answers, but I mean you are constantly thinking about what those answers could be. So a good example is recently there was obviously the Nobel Prizes and things like that that got released. Uh, everybody sort of got their awards, and things like that. If somebody won, uh, the, if you're in the chemistry field, for example, somebody won, won the prize in chemistry, your timeline, if it is Twitter that we're using, for example, any comments, feedback, interaction, anything that you can make that is relevant specifically to that, if you filled your network with people that are also in that field, then they will buy into that and go, Oh, yeah, this person like really knows about the field and things like that. And you'll be referred to more connections. You'll be seen as a person that consistently engages and talks about these things. So it's almost about building yourself up to be sort of like, I'm not an expert based on necessarily knowledge, but I'm very up to date with things that are going on. Uh, and the final one, 
I think it's something that everybody here can take away as sort of Carmen mentioned before, you've all, or a lot of you have previously been involved in putting yourself out there, facilitating events and things like that is networking is, is a give and take relationship. You can't just expect to gain something from networking. You can be a mentor yourself. You can give advice to people, offer things to people and sort of be a nice figure. Early. You'll end up getting that back tenfold. So the more you give, the more you'll give back. So an example that I always give is on LinkedIn. If you receive a message that sort of says, oh, I've seen that you work here. Like, would you be able to introduce me to this person? Somebody is actively asking you straight away. So when you read that, you think, well, what am, I, what am I gaining from it? Or are you just asking me, are you just using me for my connection, for example? Whereas if that person opens up with an introduction of, oh, hi, I saw you work at this place. This looks really interesting. Like I also used to work in that field. Um, it'd be great to connect. And uh, if I can give you any advice, let me know. That person is reaching out and going, actually, I have some value too that I can give you in this two-way networking relationship. I could potentially let you learn something. And in return, would you be able to do this for me? And it comes across so much, so, so, so much better. And you seem like such a different person to if you go out there actively thinking, okay, my only goal is to build up my network so I can gain these things. I just want to meet as many people in SciComm as possible. So I get a SciComm job, and then I'm closing my Twitter account, my job's done. It never really works like that. So it's about how can you utilize your skills to um, work your way in, if that makes sense. So what next for you all on this call is not as relevant because actively networking people, as we've mentioned. But if you are thinking, right, I want to take a tangible step from this. We've, I've heard about network. I already knew some of the stuff, some of the stuff I didn't know, but it's given me that step to put on my to-do list, right? I'm going to do these things. The one thing to do is make sure that you join scientist or a networking platform or whatever it is or have a little update of one that you've or not does your bio completely uh, reflect the person you are have you got all those jigsaw pieces that make up the person you are showing in in your bio or in your recent tweets if you go into your timeline now and you scroll down the last five things that were tweeted or retweeted what picture does that paint as you as a person does it paint an expert in the chemistry chemistry field that knows loads of things that's going on and you've also shown that you're an empathetic person, but also likes a joke because you've replied to these people. Or when I look at it, does it just look like, oh, it's five complaints about my life and things that are going on. That doesn't really, doesn't really make me look like the kind of person that I am. So the next steps is to put yourself out there, have a look at your social media account or create a new one. Scientist is great. Um, and go, okay, how can I make sure that I'm always reflecting the person that I am in this? Cool. And the last thing that I had, I didn't actually ask Carmen if this was allowed. I hope it's allowed. If it's not, cut this out of the video. Um, but for sort of a little bit how I talked about the give and take, I felt a little bit bad saying, oh, it's the give and take shit. And then I was just coming here and telling you all to sign up to the scientist platform. So I thought it was only right that in practice, I tried to sort of outwardly give something. Um, so Scientist Studio is sort of like a off branch of what we do, essentially because the scientist platform can't pay for itself. And we ask people to pay for something that we think they shouldn't have to pay for. So as a way to fund the projects I've been working on, we decided to also branch out into SciComm. So we create animated videos of people's research. So you might have seen them if you already follow us on Twitter. But if you um, have some work that you've been doing and um, you think, okay, how can I disseminate this information out to the public? Or how can I show everybody what I do in a really precise way and they don't need any understanding of my subject? Then we take all that, put it into a 150 word summary, animate it and make you a video that explains exactly what you do in a nutshell. Um, and normally people are charging like I'm not going to other companies out of professionalism, but you can Google yourself how much these services should. Cost. And it's like if you get anything below four figures, then you can send it to me and say, here's a really cheap company. Um, but we for, for research students, we only charge 59 pounds for this. Um, like we've literally made it the bare minimum possible to cover our costs and put it into this into the scientist platform uh, and then you can get five pounds off there if you use that code um so feel free to get in touch if there's anything that you're interested in um at all but i just thought that's my gesture and my thing to leave you with um, you've given me a chance to come and talk to you about the scientist platform so i'll give you a little something back uh just out of practice so i think unless I'm going to get a nasty surprise and things on the next slide. I think that's the end. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, I welcome any questions at all that you have, anything that you think 
this is good. This is not good. This is a problem. This is something I should add. And any comments as well, just like in general, something that you've thought, experience you've had, something that's really helped you build your network, anything that's relevant at all. And as people have got the emoji going on, which is quite good, could we just have like a, a thumb up or something? If you have a profile on, if you, oh, how can I say, okay, if you use academic Twitter daily, so if you're like a daily user of Twitter, just give a thumbs up. If you don't want to do the emoji, you could actually, I just thought about, you could actually just do a physical one, which is probably even better. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of that. Great. So everybody already like, is actively out there, which is great. That's a really good thing. Um, and I've done a similar presentation at Durham University where I went before to their postgraduate researchers, and it was probably about 50%. And as somebody that actively uses it, I couldn't believe that like so many people were missing out on these opportunities. And about 90% of the people that were there wanted a job outside of academia. So they needed to be networking more than anybody, but the numbers didn't really match up. And I think it's because people see Twitter as a social tool like Instagram or something where you put your holiday pictures and you don't use it with a, a strong academic intention. Um, so yeah, any questions, feel free to go for it. Just related to this last thing. First of all, very, very great presentation. I, I loved it. I have some comments later. I, I just started to use Twitter this year. I wonder if there was so active, like the academic Twitter was so active the years before or not, if any of you was active before. I can say, if I can reply, I did my, my, my open my, my Twitter account also for scientific purposes when I started my PhD. So I was a lot, I was very involved in the science communication um, uh, community in, in Spain. Uh, that is where I started my PhD. But later, when I started, my, when I was like more into the PhD, and I was like in that moment where you feel like you're so overwhelmed by everything, I started to leave it apart. So I knew it was like super, super, people were using it a lot and everything. And later when I, I, I left it for several years, maybe six years or something like that, and later this year I came back because my PI told me, hey, you should be on Twitter. And I said, no, I'm actually on Twitter, but I didn't use it. Say, no, you should be on academic Twitter. Here in the U.S. it's a big deal. You should enter, blah, blah, blah. And I started to use it again. And I realized it's not only an American thing. It's a global thing. And it's really like much more powerful than what I expected. And now I'm totally addicted to it. That's so true. Actually, I have to confess the same thing. I opened my account in 2011, but without any purpose. It's just a social media event. And then I quit using it. But uh, when I try to, uh, when I on the job market on uh, after completing my PhD, I realized that it's a huge deal. I mean, it's a big thing for, especially in US, everybody using it for academic purpose. And I found job from Twitter. <laughs> so, and then I arrived in the US on Mar uh, March and then I'm, I'm in the Twitter. So, but it's, I, I definitely agree with the Carmen as her PI said, I mean, it's a huge thing not even on the US, I mean, after I uh, joined the, in academic purpose, uh, after I uh, joined the Twitter for academic purpose, I realized that it's everybody using in the whole world for academic things and sharing their feelings and to get to find any support for academia. So it's, it's a great thing, I guess. I, I have a comment on, on what um, Callum said about being yourself. I totally agree with that. And I think that at the beginning I was struggle. I was struggling a little bit more about that. And I was like, well, what, the, what do you mean? Because I was reading this in a lot of like comments, like, oh, just be yourself on the social media. I'm like, I, I don't know how to be myself like in the social media. That's so, that's so weird. But then I, I, yeah. I, I, hopefully I realized what that means. And I started to be more myself, like with less filters or like more, of course, yeah, you cannot be totally yourself. You have to if you, especially if you use it for academic purposes or uh, to make also professional um, connections. But, but then I also realized that a lot of people actually are very good in using it, being themselves, because then when I've met, especially this year, I've met people that I was only following on Twitter and I've met them face to face, well, on Zoom, but still, I've met them and I've spoken to them and I was like, well, it feels like I know this person already. It feels like it was exactly what I expected from this person, even if I never spoke to 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 them before. So that's totally true, and that's that's totally a great point that you raised um, about that the social networking. Sorry, my my connection just went for a second. Could you repeat the final thing you said? 
No, it's just that I think it was a great point that you mentioned about being yourself and, of course, also on scientists' uh, platform. That's totally something that um, we should do. Um, I think I have I had a, a question and then I, I'll, I'll leave other people um, speak. Uh, um, can can we can we create new uh, groups of um, like common interests on on, on scientists? Yeah, How yeah. How do we do that? So so okay. something that we've something so so something that we've really thought about is Twitter is brilliant, like everybody said, in terms of the they've got the algorithm perfect of it being like addictive enough for you to be able to go on. You refresh your timeline. There's always new content, and that people use it. It is good for forming some sort of connections in the sense you can follow people and see their opinions and they can follow you back. The one thing that we couldn't really, it's kind of like trying to blend Twitter and Facebook together in a sense that the one thing that we really liked about Facebook is people can have their groups. So if you're like a lab group or something, then that's where rather than a group chat, you can have a group where important information goes, things like that. And a lot of universities in the dig, in the, the sort of COVID world have done that on Microsoft Teams. So they can have a channel or, or on Slack where they have one for documents and it's very separate. They have like a messaging um, chat and things like that. Um, so on scientists, we're, we're still not exactly sure the best way to do it yet. And, but at the moment, we're trying to work out, okay, if you have a group idea that you want, you can literally just go on, create people to it and... Some people thought, oh, that'll be really good. And there's some groups that only got two or three members because actually they initially really liked the idea and were enthusiastic. And then they thought, oh, actually, like, I don't really have a purpose for this. But some groups have taken off a little bit more. So we have one that is called Academic Startup. Academic? Oh, it's something to a startup. I can't remember the exact title. But basically, it's people that are in academia who are interested in business, entrepreneurship, and want some other people to be able to bounce ideas off of business ideas and how did you go up funding for it and things like that. Um, where quite a few people have joined that group and sort of actively use it. So if anyone had any ideas, you can go on and, and, and do that. But we are under the agreement that scientists is at a point where people will go on and there'll be thousands of people joining into a group and things like that because we've not refined how the platform works well enough yet for you to have a really enjoyable experience. Um, we're still figuring out what is it exactly that you want. Yeah, I have a question. First of all, I think... This is amazing. I've been following you on Twitter, but I have to confess that I just opened my account right now. Like, I don't know, half an hour ago while you were talking. I think it's awesome what you did. But I have a question about how many people you have right now and how much people are engaging. Because I think the, great, the idea is great and I love it, especially in these times where we cannot go to conferences and we want to keep the contacts and, and everything. I think it's awesome. But I was wondering how much uh, impact you're having now and how much growth you're expecting yeah yeah that's a really good question and it's kind of like i'm almost my own worst enemy in the sense that i have high expectations of where i want the platform to get what it can become and because i also do the social media and things like that i see how busy academic twitter is and how easy it is to write a tweet and often you can make a comparison of how active other platforms should be um, to give some statistics, the so platforms like ResearchGate, Academia.edu, and things like that, we have our daily active users are over 10% higher than those. So obviously, if they've got, say, 15 million members, then whatever that say theirs is under 1%, ours might be 11% or whatever it is. So obviously, the numbers are not quite the same, but ultimately, we expect that to a certain extent. And in terms of people going on and we get two or three new blogs a week from people that just fancy posting it or videos, we're really, imp really pleased with it. And the two sort of gauges that we have to answer your question is the first one is how can I attract more people to come to the platform? So that's like my marketing dial that I can go, okay, let's go more people, more people, more people. And then I've got this one, which is sort of like my um, value or quality dial, which is people that arrive on the platform. How can I make sure they have a brilliant experience? And when we first launched, I was just going, more people, more people. And in five weeks, we got a thousand members. And I think that if I'd kept going like that, I could have got, we could probably be on 5,000, 10,000 now. But every, when people were arriving, they were going, ah, oh, this is quite a cool idea, but what do I use it for? Like, why do I need it? And sort of wouldn't come back. So we had to go, okay, stop, stop what we're doing here. Like we've got enough members, 1,500, let's keep it here. And let's work out from this loyal group of people that we have who use the platform. What are they using? Like, where do they spend time on the page? Like, do they like blogs? Do people even want blogs or should we remove it? And there's so many features that we've added and removed based on what people were just ignoring or what they were using more. So to sort of answer your question, once we figured out with this 1,500, like, what works and what doesn't. And we started to add some community engagement features. So we have ideas for like a collaboration board where 
we have like a weekly thing that everybody we like gauging the interest of the community. So there's like a weekly question or some sort of board. You have their ideas onto it, and at the end of every week, there'd be like a this is what scientists think about this, or this is like a solution we came to for this problem, and things like that. Um, once we've got those people engaging, then I can start having fun again with my how can I get more people, and we can sort of get really excited about people joining the platform. So yeah, it's it's twofold. But as for how many people get in the end, who knows? But I think academic Twitter shows you that they're people that actually outwardly want to engage so if we could get some of those it'd be great but also for me it's people that feel that twitter's not the right place for them to network they're also target people to go okay well if you don't want to use social media and you want that to still be pictures of your cat and you don't want to talk about science that's absolutely fine but like here's another platform where you can just talk about chemistry if that's what you want to do so yeah who knows but it's a really good question uh, you answered perfectly the question. I think it was the best answer you could give to me because it's really how you get the people, but also how you make this useful. Because I think you great the, you did a great parallelism with the research gate that I'm connected. And I go there and say, oh, yeah, I'm increasing in my impact, whatever is the number they put. But actually, I only that's go there it. to see how awesome I am, not to interact with people. That's the truth. I mean, that's <laughs> that is funny, but but it's a bit true, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, this is only I'm getting like more and more popular because I have more publication. I'm getting older. So it's somehow it's like a measure of how old you are, I guess. So <laughs> that is not a great thing for networking, I think. But thank you. It was a great answer. And I am looking forward to it. Do you have an app? Because I'm trying to download it and I don't find it. That's what I was about to ask if, if you're planning to have an app. Yeah, so that's the other thing. So obviously, as I mentioned with like finances and working at how things, the app is something that we definitely, we like desperately want. And we were in the process of developing it and making it good because ultimately part of the benefit of Twitter is you can just lock, go on your phone and just go like, this is great or take a picture of something. You have to have an app. No one's going to survive without it. And we know that and we know it's something that we want. But again, it's that if we're going to commit to putting the effort because we develop everything in-house, the, the effort to do it and also the money that we need to do it, it's like, do we actually have something here that people are going to take out of their pocket and, and, and go on to? So I think at the moment it does give you, there's an option to like, you can, I don't know if people use iPhone, but like you can save it onto your home screen. So it's kind of like a cheap, it's like how to get onto the website quickly, but it's not actually an app. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we're working on and, even now we're trying to make the site more mobile friendly with how you use it and things, but it's one of those things. We'll get there, hopefully. No, it is mobile yes. friendly. <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, I just kept like doing it. You were talking, that's what you were talking. Do you reply your answer and say, where's the app? Where can I download it? I mean, I'm so, now they are. Yeah, sweet. but yeah, definitely. I mean, the uh, the application should be probably the uh, turning on switch. Yeah. I must admit that most of the, the, the time that I, I don't go there, it's because there's not an app. And I, I usually use my social networks on the phone. And and but so I, I think that like me, a lot of people do like that. So I think that, like you said, you're going to have a lot more engaged. I will try to like go more on. <laughs> you motivated me to go more on that <laughs> platform now. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's been on the back of my mind. I mean, I've joined in the very beginning and I loved it. But yeah, just being like very busy. And and like you said, yeah, that like with an app, you can just go on, on your phone. And like I use Twitter mostly from my phone. I, I almost never use it from my, um, I, unless I have really to like, right threads then in that case i use it for my computer but in other cases i just 90 percent of the time i use it for my phone and then if i delete like i deleted like earlier this year facebook from my phone and i've never used it again i mean that's really like that's how it works yeah no 100 and i think that's like it, it might seem really minor and like we're just having like information but they're the really valuable things that we need to know in terms of like it's great. You like the idea of it, but it's just not accessible. And that for us is something where we can go, okay, how can we make this as accessible as possible? And we've, we've had the same with a lot of different things that we've, when you're trying something as sort of you did with Bioroom and worked out, of like, okay, this is, we're just assuming people might like this sort of thing. And as you more events, you worked out, oh, actually there's a demand for this or people want this and they really like this. That's exactly what we're doing at the moment in terms of we've had ideas that I genuinely thought were going to make this like the best company in the world and be like, everyone's going to love this. Like, we're going to get a million people. And then like two people were like, oh yeah, right. And I was like, oh, I've got the audience so wrong in my head. But likewise, things where I thought 
oh, I better just put it out there, like, go on, we'll see what happens. And people have gone, oh, this is really good. And we've had to sort of go, wow, we didn't expect this sort of reaction. So, yeah, a lot of it is just assumptions, making the best guesses you can. But being able to speak at, at places like this where we get that time to have a bit of feedback from potentially going to be users is, is brilliant. Yeah, I don't want to be super annoying, but I'm going to ask you more questions. So do you have like any stories of right now, because you started recently about, about uh, people that really um, made a connection that allowed them to find a job or to really make a connection that changed their careers or, you know, like these kind of things. Do you have any experience that you can share of what your platform meant to other people? Yeah, so I've got one really good one, actually. So I don't know if anybody is... I don't, do you know who Ken, Ken Dutton registers? Some people might know him. He's an Australian, um, yeah. Yeah. brilliant guy who makes, yeah, yeah, he makes sitcom videos, who makes videos about loads of different things. Um, he does like, I don't know how he does everything, but he like researches, he does a million things basically. Um, and he started posting videos on our platform um, because it was a way that we wanted him to be able to test it out and see if it worked. But also um, on YouTube, you rely on the algorithm to show people videos. So, for example, one part of you on YouTube really enjoys watching Psycom content, but the other really likes watching, like, I don't know, like videos of sports or something, then you're obviously going to get a mixture of those on your suggested videos. So if you post something on Scientist, then you know that the dedicated audience of people that are there just for that style of content will be there looking for other things as well. So he posted it out there just to go, oh, let me try and gain some more exposure. It all counts for my YouTube views. That's great. And one day I got an email, like just from a university, like I said, and I was just checking through. It was kind of like an upcoming events thing, like a, to all um, postgrads. And I saw, I was like, a, like guest speaker, Ken, I'm registered. I was like, this is, must be more than, a, more than a coincidence. I was like, that's just like a bit weird of all the people in the world that it could be. So anyway, I contacted the person that had sent the email uh, who works at the university. I was just like, oh, like, hi, Paul, like, event looks really good. I'm just wondering, uh, do you, like, how do you know Ken? Because we've been working with him for ages. Like, that's really great that, that you know each other. And he said, oh, well, I came on the platform to see what you guys were doing because uh, people have been, like, talking about it. And I went on to see what it was like. And I saw this guy and how charismatic he was and how brilliant he was. And because we're doing a virtual event, we don't have to fly him here from Australia. So I thought he'll be a perfect fit for the event. So we asked him if he wanted to be involved with it. He said, yeah. So it was brilliant. So that's just like an example of where somebody actually went on, was spotted, like, if you will, and was like, oh, that'll be great to work with. Or that's someone I want to work with. Um, so then they got involved. So that's like my one like success story that I'm, I put out there all the time. I have a question. So um, a few of your tips make me thinking because I'm only a master student so i would like to do a phd later but have not started yet and like a few points of yours were like be the expert or like show what you can give but most people that i know on academic twitter are either phd students or like pis or postdocs and i feel like everyone is more expert than i am and i feel like what is that i could give so that was something yeah that made me think <laughs> yeah it's like it that class like imposter syndrome thing though but i think you almost need to flip that like i'm i'm no expert on this either so this could be wrong but i think you need to just flip your mindset in terms of what i've noticed a lot is because when i'm running the social media people that interact with our tweets sometimes i've just got a mindset where i presume that everybody will be a phd student or something like that so if i click on somebody's profile who's interacted and i see in their bio it's like master student i'm like oh they're that i actually think it's like that they're almost better in that sense that I'm always I, I think to myself like can you still hear me no not anymore <laughs> well in since he's on, he's not coming back I can tell you one thing here I mean I wish I was more engaged as you are with all these kind of activities when I was starting in my master so don't say you're only a master that's not fair and later I think that younger people bring new ideas to academia I don't know I mean that's what I was saying before, the only measure of, of how much paper, citation, whatever we have, it's how old we are. <laughs> that is all. So if you're just younger and that's good. Uh, Kira, can I say Thanks. something to that sure. also? Um, so my motto is everybody operates from incomplete knowledge. So that means including your professors, your postdocs, your PhDs, Nobody knows everything, right? So, so in fact, you may know more on certain things than your professors, right? So in, in a collaborative view of the world, we are all trying to get closer to the truth together, 
rather than sort of uh, co uh, competing and monopolizing truth. Because nobody knows everything, you know, everybody needs to contribute in sort of a circle way of life rather than top down hierarchy. So maybe that helps you alleviate some of that anxiety you may have when you are talking to interacting with people who have higher degrees, but you know, they, they know something really in depth, but then there's other things where you actually may know something, you know, that, that contributes also. So don't be shy. And it's, it's hard and because normally <laughs> Sometimes, our, yeah. <laughs> our academic system is so hierarchical and rank oriented and, you know, everything gets counted and, you know, how many publications you have and so on, right? You know, Einstein didn't have any publications when he published his first paper. So, you know, it's, it's really, your track record is not who you are necessarily, right? Because it's only what's recorded in stone, meaning in publications. But you could be working on some super duper, you know, project and you haven't published it so who knows right so give yourself thanks. the benefit yeah. of the doubt if i can say okay thank you thanks and persist as i said <laughs> important Einstein said the important thing is to not stop questioning and that also includes questioning our authorities who don't know everything i mean they know a lot right so you have to give them that those those kudos and those those uh, you know respect of course but at the same time, you know, when you know something, no, don't be shy. Thanks. It, it really helps to just to just hear it, I think. Yeah, thank you. To and, both of you. <laughs> I mean, we, we live, we live, and we'll get to that actually next week a little bit. We live in, in an academic system that comes back from the 11th century feudal times, all run by men, extremely hierarchical and we are still in the process of changing that, right? So you know the Christian Andersen story about the emperor with no clothes. And, and who says that the emperor has no clothes? The child, right? Because everybody else is stuck in hierarchical thinking and doesn't dare saying anything. So, but we'll talk more about that next week. So back to Callum here. Thank you for your- Very well said. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. That, that was inspiring. No, 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 I definitely agree. Always. That was super inspiring and very powerful. And I love so much having you on all these conversations. That, thank you very much. De nada. Okay, so um, do, does any, are, any of you have other comments or a question for Callum? I guess I have just I... one last one, maybe. <laughs> um, it's late. Well, for me anyway. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, during my PhD, no one ever said, oh, you should network. Oh, you need to be proactive, you know. So I guess for Caleb and the people who co-founded scientists, was it you being naturally proactive or was it from like just observing other people going, hang on, this is a niche I need to fill. Hang on, people are networking. I need to do this, but how do I do this? So how did that come about? Were you naturally proactive or is it something that people taught you or you just gained it along the way to start this up altogether? Yeah. It's a good question. I think it's kind of like the chicken and the egg really, isn't it? It's like, I can't take anything away from myself in the sense that I am the sort of person that in different contexts, completely unrelated to academia, I enjoy networking with people. I see the value very much in like, whether we like it or loathe it in the world, it's very much like who you know, not what you know in a lot of aspects. So in terms of that, then I do recognize myself, the idea that we need to network and things like that. But more than anything with scientists, it's myself and, and Hassan, who's my co-founder, he did a research placement in a Vienna Biolab in Austria and came back to the UK and was like, ah, connect with, I'd connect with these people. And I was sort of like, oh, well, just, you know, just does everybody connect? And we were like, oh, nobody really connects anywhere. They use Twitter for it. And Twitter inherently, like I've said, great platform, but it doesn't have certain functions that a community needs to exist. You can't have loads of mini communities within Twitter without some extreme overlap. There's no privacy is the wrong word, but no sort of like, it's not a closed loop at any point. So we sort of said to ourselves, well, how about we make a place where academics can network and, and do things. And from there is what you see scientists where I talk about academic development, career development, like that was, that was never things that we initially thought academics needed. 
we sort of learned that when we went into this phase of going, let's research where students are doing it. What, what do PhD students do? Where do they connect? What do their universities advise them to do? Is there a certain platform that all universities subscribe to and tell people this is where you should be directed and things like that? So I think we, we did grow it out of sort of a solution to a problem is good in, in one sense, but also don't get me wrong, like a lot of the time I do wish we fully just knew exactly what we're doing and we were almost copying somebody else's thing because it'd be so much easier to make something better than somebody else rather than try to create something new, if that makes sense. I, I think Jake made a great point for one thing. So during my, my PhD, I heard a lot of this thing, oh, you need to work on your network. You need to do networking. You need to go and do networking. But no one teaches you how to do it. So you are struggling. I mean, I was struggling for years. Okay, how do I do that? There's not like a formal way to do it that's what i really appreciate that you created this platform because it's so oh yeah yeah it's so important that's what can bring you the job you can give get a job by networking is the most important thing yeah okay well i mean i need to network but it's like writing or even like leadership skills everyone oh yeah you should develop your writing skills oh yeah you should develop your but it's not like trial and error there's not like a formal i mean we're so good at creating syllabus for 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 different classes and we're not able to create like a way of learning how to network and a way to learn how to write and learn how to do all these things. How, how is that possible? How don't we put like much more effort in something we think it's important, right? So, so you did it and, and you did it not only for you, you did it for a lot of people and that's awesome. I think that that's great. I don't know if Jake is, is laughing at me or he has something around that it's happening or what. No, I'm, I'm not laughing. I'm just, I'm just agreeing with you, you know, it's, um, yeah, I agree. Like, you know, one tells you, but like, okay, here we are discussing that we can do this somehow. Yeah, I mean, and we must do it. That's the thing. And I enjoy doing it. But you know, my PI was so bad. My PI from, from PhD was so bad at networking. You have no idea. He was awful at it and you model what you see right so i was my pg i think i have like a very sociable personality but later i struggled so much because i couldn't learn i didn't know how it worked i didn't know how how to do it so it's also an art i guess i don't know i think i think there's different ways to to depending on the personality you don't have to force it so it's it's like you, you can approach networking in different ways that's probably also why there's not only one way to teach it. And it's not like, I think, I think writing, there's something you can teach about writing, but still, I mean, there is something creative about that and, and uh, other, other things that you cannot really teach. But then um, networking is really something that, yeah, you have, it goes by trials and error, like, like you said, and then platform like, like scientists really, really helps. So that's, that's great. One one last thing that I wanted to mention to Callum is that it seems like that you are a very human uh, platform. Uh, so you're building it from the community because like you said, you reached a number of people. You didn't care about reaching more people. You could have. You could definitely have because through other means you, you were able to reach such a high number in such short time. So you could have definitely have like 10,000 people, 20,000 people, but you didn't care about that because you wanted to make it human. You make it. You wanted to make it accessible for all of them. Make it enjoyable, and I think that that is the power of scientists, and that is why it will be and it will grow very different from Richard Gate. And and I really think that we will see great things from that because of this. Yeah, no, that's that's really kind of you to say, and I think it's from from like a a moral perspective, but also like even if you were to think about it in business terms like unless you're very clear on what the value is that you think then there's no longevity in anything and i mean again i i, I don't want to go into like saying oh there's some twitter accounts or whatever, whatever but like well, the one thing that i wanted to say about networking is like it's not associated with followers or following that's very different to who your network is so if you have five thousand followers that doesn't mean you have a network of five thousand people because of that you might only actually if you look at your followers and think how many can i send a message to how many do I actually know like their career journey and what they went through or what advice they might have for me? It's probably a number that's far more limited than that. So when people say like, oh, you need to go and network, I think why it seems like such a big proposition is because everyone thinks, oh God, like I've got a set up a Twitter account with zero followers and I need to get it to at least above 500 or no one's going to think I'm serious and everyone's going to think I'm bad at networking. And th this is like the complete 
sort of opposite thing. And that's why on scientists, when we were deciding like, should we do it as followers? We're like, no, we'll do it as a connection request, like on LinkedIn, because you're sort of offering, let, let, let's connect. And we sort of have this mutual relationship that by exchanging this connection request and you proving it, that we can rely on each other if we need something. So if you send me a message, I can try my best to answer it, or I can like offer you some value and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think one thing sort of mentioning what Carmen and, and Jake were saying about how, how do you start and go about it? I think numbers is one of the worst things that you can start thinking of. and sort of some massive accounts have hundreds of thousands, twenties of thousands and things like that. But if you were to break it down and say, what is the, like, what does this account do? What is the actual value of it? Then I think a lot of accounts are very, very much the same that have a big following. It's, oh, well, we just amplify other people and that's something that's brilliant that's great if you can get your message out to loads of people it's fantastic if you've got a survey or a poll where you need people's opinions or what whatever it is it's fantastic to have a tool that can amplify and and unite people and it's essentially why hashtags were created really wasn't it it was like oh we can all see everything that's got this same keyword and therefore i can find people that like the same thing i am or find the same tv program that i'm watching on a saturday night because everyone's used the hashtag and things like that uh, um but so for us, finding what our actual value is and what we're giving people, for me, and always will be for me, is how can we give tangible, genuine connections for people? So if you go to the platform and you're there for a year and you make two really good connections with people, one of them gets you a job, one of them you end up being like online friends with and they're your support network, job done. Like, that's perfect. You don't need to go on there and get a thousand connection requests and be this person that's like, yeah, I've got such a big network on scientists because I've got these thousand people that I'm friends with because that's great. Thank you so much, Callum. Um, unless others have other comments or questions, I think we can start to wrap up and Callum, if you yeah. want to join for our last event next week, um, Michael is going to speak about the social construction of science. So it's going to be really interesting. And so Thanks, everybody. Some, some, we had a great discussion. So thanks again, Callum, very much for being here, for sharing uh, with us um, all your insights about networking. And yeah, I think a lot of people liked it. If you read the comments in the chat. And so that, that was great. I really loved it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Carmen. Nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Bye, everybody. It's great. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.